Hey everyone, welcome back to another SUP Border video. In this SUP Border video, we're gonna be doing something a little bit different. We're gonna be showing you our recent trip to the Shark Trust. The Shark Trust is a charitable organization that was founded in the UK back in 1997, and they're fully dedicated to safeguard the future of all our shark skates and rays around the world. We interview a small selection of their team members to help us understand what they do and the importance of the Shark Trust. This is very much in collaboration with Shark Sup as well, who are now supporting the Shark Trust financially. So definitely a little bit of a different video from us, but we really hope that it gives you a good understanding of what the Shark Trust do and how we can support them. I'm gonna to speak to four members of the team, starting off with Kat Gordon, who's the Senior Conservation Officer. We're gonna be speaking about the Great Egg Case Hunt, which has been going for 20 years now, and moving into the new app that they've just developed, which really helps us log all our findings and shark encounters with the Shark Trust. And we're also gonna be touching on how we could interact with sharks if we were lucky enough to maybe see a basking shark when we're out paddleboarding. Our projects were mainly established in the UK, the Great Air Case Hunt especially, was, it was launched from a chance find on a beach in Devon 20 years ago, so we're celebrating 20th anniversary of that this year. Um, but we get records from all around the world now. What would you do with that data? I mean, do you count how many egg cases you find in that location? What type of egg case? And yeah, it's a really good indicator of species diversity. So depending on the different, the shapes, the sizes, the different features of an egg case, you can tell which species laid it. So within the British Isles, there's around 13 species that you might get wash yeah. up, some more common than others. Some you'd find all the way around the coastline, others you have to be in kind of very specific areas to find them. Um, but we can look at what species there are. So by finding an egg case, you can identify, okay, we know that um, kind of a flapper skate was in that, that region and was, was laying fairly nearby. Um, if we can get records from those that are seen developing underwater, from divers, paddleboarders, snorkelers, then we can help kind of connect where the egg cases wash up on the beach with where the actual egg laying grounds are. Wow. So us as paddleboarders, we could actually potentially see an egg case underwater, entangled on seaweed or... Yeah, species, so the two of the cat sharks, the nurse hound and the small spotted cat shark, they've got tendrils on each end, mm -hmm. which kind of they use to, to curl them around seaweed. The female will kind of swim around and around the seaweed and it will kind of tie it on. Um, almost like string um, yeah. onto the seaweed and those ones can be laid very in kind of shallow waters um, so you can wow. quite often see those on, on low tides um, you see them kind of attached to the seaweed the skate ones are on the seabed so you're kind of probably less likely to see those but, ones yeah. whilst paddle boarding so really every time somebody goes paddle boarding at the beach as they're pumping up the label paddleboard or they're going, they should just keep an eye on the seaweed lines? Yeah, it's, it's the power of collective action as well. Kind of one person picking up one egg case might not tell as much other than this species was nearby yeah. at some point in the fairly recent kind of past. But if everyone picked up an egg case, if everyone recorded, we'd get a much better picture of kind of relative abundance um, of diversity, species presence, and then we can start looking at different seasonal trends over time yeah. as well and see what's happening through the years. Yeah. And if you're, if we're lucky enough to be paddleboarding and we see a basking shark in, in the British Isles, it's the most common one, or down in Cornwall, how should we interact with that? experience of seeing that shark? So we've got a code of conduct that we develop for water users so that covers swimmers, divers, um, those on motorised vehicles as well as um, kayaks and, and paddle boarders as well so the key thing is to keep your distance, mm -hmm. don't paddle towards it, don't try and kind of um, go in front of the, the direction of, of travel yeah. um, in case it kind of spooks it and, and disturbs it. Generally if they're at the surface they're feeding so they'll probably just carry on feeding as they were and won't be too bothered but as long as you just kind of keep a healthy distance and, and respect their space and, and try not to disturb them. Um, they are quite often called gentle giants but they are capable of breaching so they can really? leap clean out of the water wow. which you don't want that landing no. on. <laughs> so um, it's, it's just best to kind of keep a distance and um, kind of leave them to, to carry on feeding and you'll quite often find that they're curious anyway and they might kind of swim swim past you and come closer yeah. but again um, if you've seen one you can report that sighting back to us so we can have a look at, at seasonal trends and what's happening there. We'd previously had an app that was just for the Great Egg Case yeah. Hunt um, so we've wrapped up that one and now we've got one that covers all of our citizen science projects so whether you've seen a basking shark fin, whether you've seen oh, wow. found an egg okay. case on the beach, um, if you've seen a shark entangled in netting, um, you can go onto our app and you can submit your sighting 
through that. Um, anytime you submit a sighting, you get a shark reward card as well. So you get a little kind of, like with your Pokemon cards, you get oh, wow. a card yeah. that ranges from bronze, silver or gold um, that you can you can try and find just to try and encourage you to get out and, and find find even more cases and um, record your, your shark sightings. Free to download on both um, Google Play Store and, and Apple Store as well. So it's yeah. definitely, it should be every, every powder waters kit bag. Yeah, it? definitely get it downloaded. <laughs> Great to hear Kat speaking about that new app, so make sure you get involved and get that one downloaded completely free. Now we're gonna to speak to Dr. Connor John. Connor's been in charge of the new art project called Oceanic 31. He's also gonna to touch on a bit of myth busting as well, where people perceive sharks as a huge threat and danger, but actually we should really see them and what amazing creatures they really are and we really need to protect. So the oceanic species would be classed as species that kind of spend a lot of their time or a, a large amount of time in the open ocean. So these are the oceans beyond kind of national borders mm -hmm. in the high seas. Um, and a recent paper found that 24 of the 31 spe uh, oceanic species that are looked at of, of sharks and rays um, were in one of the threatened classes of the really? IUCN Red List, um, which means that basically they're not doing so great. Yeah. Um, in comparison, back in the 1970s, uh, there are only five on the on the Red List, uh, wow. on, on so the threatened list. So it's really changed. Obviously, we know now that kind of, A, the number of species has increased because we've kind of done more research and found that there are more species, um, and the monitor has increased, but we have a better idea of the kind of situation. Mm. Um, so Oceanic 31 sort of sprung from that and also from the need to kind of engage people in new and, and kind of interesting ways. I basically just went off um, and contacted loads and loads of artists um, and asked them um, to create and donate a piece um, that focused on one of 31 oceanic species, which is how we got lots of artists to create and donate some amazing pieces. So we have some amazing. pieces here now. So this is by Loretta Vila, um, Inked by the Ocean. Um, so she did a lovely dusky chart for us um, wow. using a method called stippling. And then we've also got a digital artist, he's actually an animator, called Will Rose. And he does a lot of animation work for a series called Hey Dougie, which is a kid's show. Um, and he did an amazing blue shark. And then these pieces, so we're going to have 31 in total, which are going to be brought together in June. And then they're going to go on exhibition tour around the UK. Oh, wow, so people get a chance years. to see them in the flesh. People are going to get a chance to go see them um, in the flesh. Some of them are much bigger. So there's a piece by a guy called ATM, who's a street artist. He's done a piece on plywood board, which is a metre and a half by two and a half metres. So a little bit big to fit wow, in here. Yeah. Um, so they'll get to go and see them. We're also going to have an online exhibition as well. And that'll also come with um, interpretation in the form of videos. And we've got some really exciting panels Panels, which will kind of explore the Oceanic 31 species, kind of do a deep dive on some of the species and also some of the reasons that we need to help kind of support and protect these amazing yeah. species. But also I think there's uh, been a recent kind of climate positivity and kind of this positive yeah. shift in how we talk about climate issues and conservation issues. Um, so Oceanic 31 kind of sprung from that to kind of put a positive light and to kind of show off and really show that sharks are amazing and these species are really awesome. That's why we need to protect them. Mm -hmm. um, and that's quite a different tact I think to what things used to be like in the kind of 1990s and early noughties, where previously kind of we were battling this idea that sharks are dangerous and yeah. sharks are killers. Um, and I think the organizations can spend a lot of time uh, trying to kind of myth bust and trying to fight those sort of things. So you're putting out things like toasters kill more people than sharks, which they do, but you're still also yeah. kind of saying sharks are killers, whereas in reality, mm. the, the number of kind of uh, human shark interactions are so small that it's not worth wasting our time really. No. Um, we'd rather just show that these species are awesome and they're amazing yeah. and help people to get really excited and interested in them and that will hopefully then shift um, people into kind of being more excited. So thanks Connor for the information and bringing that Oceanic 31 project together. Now we're going to speak to Ali Hood who's the Director of Conservation. We're going to ask her why is shark conservation so important and try and get an understanding of what she does at government level to get policies changed to make shark fishing more regulated or even banned in certain cases. People often ask us, so why is shark conservation important? And I, I really don't think there's one definitive answer for this. It really depends on the context, on the perspective in which you are at that, at that time. A sort of stock answer would be because sharks and their relatives are really vital for the health of the marine ecosystem. Another more fundamental one would be that we need to maintain species diversity. But we should also consider issues like people's passion and love for sharks, rays, for marine wildlife um, is really important, is, is important to well-being and their health and well-being. 
But then there's also the point of the economics associated with sharks and rays. So the socio-economics associated with shark fishing, well-managed shark fishing practices, with ecotourism activities, um, can actually provide some of the most tangible um, arguments for effective conservation management. The other side is that there are certain species of sharks under well-managed conditions that can support a sustainable fishery. And that's important with respect to food security in certain areas of the world. And is realistic, sharks, skates and rays are caught as bycatch in fisheries. A number of those species need the utmost level of protection, but others under appropriate science-based management are suitable for retention yeah. and therefore can contribute to the economies of fisheries, um, both large and small. And so this is, this is really a big thing to bring across. You're not there to stop people fishing sharks. You just want them to fish responsibly. We want to see, see sharks, skates and rays fished um, at a sustainable level. So for some that means no retention. Mm -hmm. There are certain species whose populations have already declined to such levels that the only thing we can do at this time is alleviate as much pressure as possible. Mm -hmm. And that's not as simple as just saying don't catch them because unfortunately they will still be caught. Mm -hmm. So you need other measures to add to that. So what we call bycatch mitigation. So avoidance or a change in handling. If we can encourage the industry, the fishing industry to handle sharks and rays in a different manner, there may be a higher chance of their survival when they're released. And as very long-lived species, the more sharks, particularly these vulnerable species, that we can see back in the environment in a fit and healthy state, the better it is for that population growth and, and um, rebuilding. And you're working very much at a high level, governments, talking to governments, getting them to realise how important this all is. What shark are you really trying to look out for at the moment? Because you obviously can't cover every single shark. You do, <laughs> there's only so many people with so many hours in a day. Well, we'd love to cover every species and we do try um, to be as flexible as we can. And the great thing about our work at the Shark Trust is that we work on public engagement through to this high level policy that you're talking about. And here we work at that science policy interface, ensuring that the best available, available data and information is provided in a comprehensible fashion to decision makers so that we're informing that decision process. And over the 25 years that the Shark Trust has been operating, we've um, contributed to shark finning regulation, to um, driving forward effective fisheries management, and that's not just the adoption, but also the implementation and compliance, and seeking that protection for some of the most vulnerable species. And in recent years, our focus, particularly in Atlantic waters, has been on blue shark and on short fin mako. Mm -hmm. Now that's two species that are caught in the same fisheries but have very, very different life history strategies and as a result the need for very different management. Um, blue shark, a, a species that could uh, be fished sustainably under the right level of management mm -hmm. and working with our partners at the Shark League we've managed to secure international management throughout the Atlantic, so catch limits for blue sharks which is a really positive step forward in their management. For short for Mako, a different story. This is a population who have, who's declined to such a level that the only way forward in the North Atlantic was to see a prohibition on retention. So that's a ban on the mm -hmm. fishing for this species. And we managed to secure this um, two years ago. This is a, a really positive step forward and now we need to see that bycatch avoidance. We need mm -hmm. to see vessels reducing the mortality and the pressure on that population. Mm -hmm. And just last year, at the end of 2022, we secured the first ever catch limits quota for shortfin mako in the South Atlantic. Mm -hmm. So progress can be slow and, and it, it takes perseverance and determination amongst our wider community, but we are making results and we are ensuring that the science is coming in to support that decision mm. making. That's fantastic. And just for the um, people who are unaware how these fish are accidentally caught, um, is it with long lines or is it with nets? What's the majority? Of There's all sorts of different gear types out there. Um, the fisheries that we're looking at in the Atlantic are predominantly long lines, mm. um, but there's also purse nets. In coastal waters, you might have trawling activities. It really depends. So the fishing industry is very diverse. The gears that they use are very diverse and you will find shark bycatch and skate and ray bycatch in most of those mm. fisheries. 
Um, it all depends on the scale and in terms of, of the shark, depends on whether that shark is then wanted for commercial sale or if they're then released again um, as discards. Mm. But in the Atlantic, in these large high seas fisheries who are primarily focused on tuna and swordfish, you see a very high level of shark bycatch mm. there. And it's working with those um, large high seas management bodies that we have a particular focus at the moment. Yeah. And obviously you as a shark trust, you're not just, you're a global reach. But that's yeah. with a lot of help from collaborators and people around the world, isn't it? Absolutely. So sort of the modest size of the Shark Trust, our reach is very much disproportionate to that. Mm. Um, and, and yes, this comes down to collaboration with trusted partners. And we are really, really fortunate that in many countries around the world, we have colleagues, partners, organisations that we can work with um, to increase everybody's reach, not just the Shark Trust, but the science-based mm. conservation community. Uh, working together, we can be more effective in terms of our lobbying, our engagement, um, the pressure that we can put on to decision makers to make change for shark skates and rays. And that community is hugely valuable to us. Um, plus it enables us to work with real specialists, um, maybe specialists in understanding how um, a particular country works or a particular issue mm. works, whether that's communication or policy or um, otherwise. And, you know, yeah, we're always grateful to that. It's a really important asset that enables us to deliver way beyond our size. It was great chatting to Ali to understand how the Shark Trust are changing governments, legislations and laws on shark fishing, and they are really making a difference. And now, lastly, we're going to speak to Paul Cox, the CEO of the Shark Trust. He's going to talk to us about the new Big Shark Pledge that they've all been working on and some general other information about how Shark Sup are working with the Shark Trust and how that sort of money allows them to do the stuff they do at the Shark Trust. So one of the things we're really focused on at the minute is we just launched a new campaign called the Big Shark Pledge. This campaign is essentially focusing on oceanic sharks. So there's basically a group of about 31 species, some of the best known sharks that we've got, those big charismatic sharks, which move kind of in and out of national waters and into mm -hmm. international waters. And when they go into international waters, they face particular threat from large uh, fisheries. So this, this group of 31 species, Big report came out a couple of years ago um, that because of that overfishing, 75% of that group are considered to be threatened with extinction and their populations have climbed by about 71% in my lifetime. So wow. only 30% yeah, as many as there were when I yeah. was born. Um, so this is obviously something that we really want to focus on. It kind of fits in with the other work that we've been doing. We've been doing work on the Mako and the Blue Sharks. And so essentially what we're going to do is take that work that we've been so successful with and kind of go further and faster. And I think the other thing is like really shining that light on overfishing because we hear yeah. a lot about we hear a lot about climate change, we hear about plastic pollution, but I think we hear a little bit less about overfishing and overfishing yeah. is having a massive impact and um, and relatively speaking it's like it's like a solvable issue, right? I mean yeah. all you need to do is create the restrictions the legislations whatever you know to to um, push fishing into a sustainable practice yeah. and then you know theoretically populations can start to recover and you so have already seen a recovery of populations haven't you so there, yeah there's a few news. populations is, i mean the, the thing with sharks is they they're long-lived and slow growing mm. so they it takes a long time for their populations to recover but there are a few okay. examples around the place um where heavy protection has then led to you know populations start to recover so the basking shark around the uk is an example where for the last 25 years there's been a really heavy um, kind of level of protection on those and now there are signs just signs yeah. that those populations around the UK are starting to, to bounce back a bit and white sharks as well down the um, east coast of the United States their populations have, have started to rebound a little bit after wow. years of being put under pressure so th there are signs that it can happen there are these kind of yeah. hope spots around there but still on the whole sharks just aren't shark fisheries um, probably not being taken as seriously as they need to be. Yeah. So we really need to kind of. I mean, because we have a huge amount of water around the world, and the sharks are a major part of our ecosystem in that. And if they're just getting overfished, it's going to have a huge knock-on effect to all these. Definitely, yeah, that's the us. thing, and it's it's and really yeah. uncertain, like what what that impact is. But it's you know it's yeah. kind of goes without saying that if you if you remove kind of these very important species that have been there for like hundreds of millions of yeah. years, something's going to go wrong. 
So that pledge you're bringing in, what can the public do and how can they, how will they be involved in that? Sh yeah. Sharing it, just having more awareness about sharks? It's a bit of both. Yeah. So the thing is with the kind of work that we need to do on high seas fisheries is that there are, there are kind of moments where um, everything's kind of happening in the background or maybe evidence being gathered or there's stock assessments or whatever. And then there are moments when we need pressure to be placed on policymakers mm -hmm. to make particular decisions. And sometimes when those moments come along, you kind of wish that you had you know, an audience of people yeah. ready to go. So that's what the Big Shark Pledge is aiming to do, is to kind of bring together a community. Um, and so it's at its simplest, it's a matter of going onto the bigsharkpledge.org website yeah. um, and clicking on the pledge. And that gives us essentially a contact with with the pledger. Yeah. Um, and then when we need them, we'll be able to contact them, keep them updated on what's going on, but say, right now you can do something, and whether that's writing to your elected representative mm -hmm. or putting a tweet out or sharing it with other people it's a, it's a kind of so it's a kind of a long-term pledge yeah uh, and then there'll be some short-term actions along the way it's like sort of petition plus yeah so it just, just enables just to keep in touch even with if people. people just get on that pledge and just sign up that's even all they can, that, that's all even they, that and if that's all they ever do yeah. that's great because then we've got the sheer numbers yeah, of people yeah. that we can say this this many people support what we're trying to do and that's i think that's the thing for paddleboarders you know we're on the ocean we're out in the environment it's such a great way to spot egg cases pumping up balls on the beach or you've been lucky enough to see them in the water which should be amazing which is definitely something i'm going to try and do this summer yeah um paddleboarding is such a great way of just seeing it and also now sharks up they've partnered up with you a few years ago with very much an awareness of helping promote you guys but now they're actually giving you some money which is obviously going to help yeah yeah i mean that 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 kind of um donations from all quarters are really useful and and it's um the great thing is it kind of gives us the, the type of money that we can get from businesses that we partner with or from donations or from people doing runs and fundraising for us all that kind of and membership subscriptions mm -hmm. all of that money um it's called unrestricted money which means basically we can develop our own projects it means we can do things that perhaps we can't get grant funding for it means wow, we've okay. got a bit of freedom we can kind of Just do it very quickly on things and so the big shark page for example that's something that we've been able to fund through unrestricted money that we've been able to very quickly pull it together set this project up get a decent video yeah. to go with it and then um, you know see how it goes and then it, and then from that point on it's just about getting as many people as we can engage with it I mean it's pretty it's not it's not very controversial you know all we're asking is for fisheries to be managed sustainably mm. so that species don't don't get pushed to extinction I mean that's that's it yeah. essentially um, but the fact that everyone can do something about it and this relationship we have with shark sups is a great example of the type of thing we want to do where we just kind of want to re reach out of our echo chamber a little bit yeah. you know and reach people that perhaps haven't thought of shark conservation before I hadn't mm. thought was, oh right there's an issue there I hadn't really realised that mm. we can through things like we're doing here we can just talk to people and, and kind of bring those issues to the table and then hopefully develop a better awareness of what, what needs to be done absolutely these amazing absolutely. animals yeah no absolutely it's something that hopefully everybody comes away from this video and thinks I'm going to get on a pledge maybe you want to be a member get a great magazine um, it's great for the kids yeah get out do a sponsored sub board yeah it's run a marathon, whatever you like. Yeah, it's all fantastic. It really all well, will make a difference, won't it? Yeah. So thanks, Paul, for speaking to us as well, but also the whole team. There's so many more team members that we didn't interview on camera. They're all so passionate about sharks. We all can really make a difference just to raise awareness, even just to get our kids into understanding how amazing and beautiful these creatures are. If you want to find out more information or help again, subscribe to the Shark Trust magazine, become a member, all that money does make a difference. And of course, thank you to Shark Sup, who are now fully financially collaborating with the Shark Trust, which really can help them do a better job in the future. Thank you very much. Any comments or experiences that you've seen sharks on the water, get them in the comments below, and we'll see you on another Sup Water video real soon.